Thank you very much. So when can we trust cyber physical systems? Um, as previous uh, speakers in this session have already kind of mentioned, we are increasingly deploying sensors and actuators, computing devices into the physical spaces that surround us to the point where we can actually have a fairly accurate digital representation of the physical space. And it's not only that we have a representation of the physical space, but also we want to be able to control it, to change it, to adapt it. And this is the case in smart homes, this is the case in smart buildings, in autonomous cars, in wearable systems for healthcare, in future industry, and so on and so on and so on. And it is important to realize that they don't just build a representation of the physical space, they also build a representation of ourselves, our likes and dislikes, our physical characteristics, where we go, what we do, and so on. And they do that in order so that they can be useful to us. So, what do all of these systems have in common? They all combine, bring together a physical element to the system, a digital element to the system, and a human element to the system. It's like, almost like three different aspects of the system itself. And that is important because as uh, Miko has said earlier on, by bringing the digital interface, the cyber interface, to the system, you make it reachable from anywhere on the internet, and therefore also to malicious actors from the internet. By taking the physical, uh, uh, by taking the, uh, the computing element out of a secure computing room and putting it into a physical space that is, for example, at street level or in the room or in the room next to it, you make it extremely, val extremely vulnerable to somebody actually going and compromising it. And it's actually very, very little that you can do in order to be able to protect it. And of course, the human element represents to a large extent a vulnerability, both to the physical space as well as to the, uh, uh, as well as to the digital space. Now, we have techniques for reasoning about physical uh, security. We have techniques and antivirus tools to reason about cyber security. We have techniques to talk about the trust we have in people. We don't really have techniques to analyze security for attacks that actually combine those three elements. So if I go in a physical space in a building and I break the door to enter into a room to connect to the network to compromise the building management system and to open the locks that allow me in the in the future spaces. We don't quite know how to do that yet. So, with such attacks, we also need to be able to do risk evaluation in real time. We need to be able to know that if some parts of the systems have been compromised, what is the risk to the other parts of the system? Unfortunately, techniques for aggregating risk information don't scale very well. So the research done within my group has focused, for example, or how, on how we can cluster the graphs and cluster the networks and use approximate inferences so that we can scale up uh, this risk evaluation. Further work needs to be done, but we're starting and we're moving towards this, and this needs to be addressed uh, as, a, as a priority concern. We also need, because we've increased the attack surface of the system so much, we also need to, in a sense, like the previous speaker have said, abandon the idea that we can entirely protect them. We need to develop the techniques that enable us to continue to operate in the presence of compromise. So we've looked at sensor networks, for example, that can monitor for fires, for, for volcano eruptions, for, for, uh, for healthcare uh, uh, symptoms. And we assume that somebody may have compromised a subset of the sensors. And as Dave uh, um, has said, one of the things that they can do is they can essentially lie about the data that they report. Here is some data from essentially the bedside in the hospital. Each one of the vertical lines are points where the, the health of the patient has been at risk. By compromising three of those sensors, we can cancel all of those points. We can mask the event in all of those, all of those points. So we have started working on techniques that enable us to detect essentially disruptions in the correlations between the measurements that enable us to detect 
that actually some of the sensors may be lying about the values that they have and they may be lying in concert. And they enable us, for example, to see that whereas you may have a real event, a real fire, for example, somebody's trying to make you believe that you have a fake one next to it. And we can de detect elicited events, so essentially spoofed events, where somebody's trying to make you believe uh, that things are there when they aren't. We can detect um, masked events, so essentially where somebody's trying to hide something like an intrusion, for example, an event, uh, an event from you. We can also distinguish that from example, from benign, uh, uh, benign faults. And not only can we detect them, but we can also characterize and identify the sensors that are likely to be compromised. We can also calculate how many compromised measurements or how many compromised sensors a network can tolerate. Um, these pictures are actually not of the event itself, in particular, uh, the one towards the right. They are actually pictures of the worst possible attack. What it would actually take for an attacker to synthesize the measurements that would essentially foil our detection mechanisms. And as you can see, they start to look pretty much like the real, uh, uh, like the real um, event itself. Now, in order to build cyber physical systems that are useful to us, we are using AI techniques. We are using machine learning. And we ask these systems to learn where we go and what we do and how the physical space around us evolves. And it needs to continuously learn because our habits change, our behavior change, um, our, our, uh, uh, our activities change. But in order to do so, it means they learn from inputs, from sensors that may be compromised. And the malicious actor can then ask the question, can then try to, to, to look at well, what if I can actually insert a point? What is the point that I can insert that would compromise the machine learning algorithm itself? What you see here is essentially a small neural network that tries to distinguish between two classes. The boundary between the two classes are the red lines. And look at how the boundary evolves when we start effectively poisoning it. So introduce points that have been crafted in order to essentially induce the maximum, the maximum error. On the other side, you can say with a different type of machine learning techniques, how introducing an additional point can shift the boundary of the, uh, uh, of the, of the classifier. Now that is aimed at essentially increasing the overall error of the classifier. But you can also introduce points that essentially change and try to make the red dots uh, uh, being recognized as blue. Essentially, in our speak, a targeted attack. And in our experiments, what we notice is that actually you don't need to compromise to introduce that many points in order to introduce fairly substantial error rates into the, uh, into the, into the algorithm. When you bring the physical world and the digital world together, and when you relate to systems with which we operate in, in, in real life, you start encountering uh, uh, conflicts between security and safety because fundamentally security relies on restricting information and restricting function, whereas safety in many cases, think you're driving 100 miles per hour down the motorway, safety requires the information and the systems to be available. And we don't quite yet know how to reconcile security and safety in all the cases, and often we rely on human input in order to do so. Miko's talk uh, um, was entitled, was looking at the challenges of scale and the, uh, the, the, the billions, the millions and billions of IoT devices that are going to be out there. And it is true. Uh, it is a challenge to protect very large scale systems. Think at the size of a city. It is also a challenge to protect very small systems because increasingly we are developing sensors that can monitor the physical space in very, very small dimensions. For healthcare in particular, implantable sensors. We are moving to biodegradable sensors. We are moving to molecular sensing. The security techniques that we have do not allow us to talk about security at that scale. And we need to invent new techniques that perhaps as well as the cybersecurity leverage the properties of the physical environment in which they are. Which brings us to the point 
uh, I've made at the beginning. These systems bring together a physical dimension, uh, a digital dimension, and the human dimension. And it is true that the system can be compromised through any of these aspects and that they all represent a threat for each other. They can also complement each other in the protection of the system because you embed the cyber element, the digital element, um, into the physical one. So the physical one can protect it to some extent as it can protect the human element. You can use the human element in order to try to teach the software how to behave in order to monitor the physical space. You can use the cyber element in order to monitor the integrity of the physical space and to monitor the behavior of the humans involved in the system as well. So we need to design techniques that allow us to essentially uh, combine these elements and know how to combine in each, in each one of the sort of IoT spaces, whether it is a smart home, whether it is a smart infrastructure, whether it is an autonomous car, how do we combine these elements in order to achieve the security uh, of the system? So when can we trust cyber physical systems? Well, when we know how to combine the physical, the, uh, the digital and the human aspects in order to engineer their security at all the scales, from the very small to the very large. When we know how to design systems that can continue to operate even when they have been partially compromised. When we can ascertain the robustness of the algorithms that we use to adversaries and where we can, when we can do risk analysis in real time. We also need to understand better when and how to hit the different trade-offs like the one, for example, between, uh, uh, between safety and security. So, the research group that I lead is looking at some of these aspects. There are many others uh, as well and many other universities in the UK. In particular, the Petras uh, IoT uh, Research Hub brings together a number of leading UK universities together with close to about 100 public and private sector partners in order to address more broadly security, privacy, adoption and acceptability, aspects of economic value, uh, as well as aspects of standards, governance, and policies. Thank you very much.